Hello everyone, just quickly before I start, I completely forgot to mention our journal meetup. So just a reminder that that is happening this weekend on Saturday. So if you would like to attend, uh, it is local to Orange County, California at Steve's Photography Studio. I've posted information on my Instagram and also on my Facebook group. It should be pinned in the Facebook group as well. Um, but it's from 10 till three and we're just gonna bring our journals. We're gonna have a great time just catching up, journaling, chatting. There'll be tables there so you can sit down and like spread out and have a good time. Time. We'll also have a dozo table, which is kind of like the same idea as take a penny, leave a penny, except you don't actually have to bring anything. It's just if you have any old art supplies, like an old set of pencils or old ink brushes or something that you don't really use that you feel like someone else might enjoy using, you can put those on the dozo table and hopefully they'll find a new home by the end of the day. Anything that is left there at the end of the day, I will find a new home for. If it's not just with me, um, <laughs> we'll uh, donate it and find it a home somewhere else. Otherwise, uh, yeah, that's about it. We'll have our rally stamp for this year and I'll bring a whole selection of my journals, not every single one, but a good chunk of them. So you can flip through those while we're there. Steve will be there, you can chat to him. It'll just be a really chill, relaxed day. It's not a ticketed event, It's not. Um, it doesn't cost anything. I just like to RSVP so I can get a good idea of numbers and also so I can give you the specific address for the photo studio so you know how to get there. Um, just a note on accessibility, it is in a private, uh, like, a business complex and it is on the second level so you'll need to ascend a, a flight of stairs which is about 20 steps so that's a note on accessibility but yes our meetup I can't wait to see you there just wanted to put this in here just in case you missed that information RSVP to James Burke at msn.com yes I still use msn.com do not say anything <laughs> um yeah looking forward to it all right let's start this video g'day friends welcome to today's YouTube video my name is James welcome back to my channel welcome if you're new I just got back from dancing. I'm going to be pretty relaxed today. I've even got my little coffee here. Little, it's huge. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Today's, it's really good. I have this oat creamer that has, it's like gingerbread oat creamer. Anyway, um, and I've been buying the like pre-made concen, not concentrate. The concentrate was yuck. Just like the pre-made cold brew uh, so that I don't buy it from Starbucks because I'm trying to save a coin. So that's my coffee for right now. I came back from jazz class, which was really good. I train in training. <laughs> I am and I am, but it just sounds so real to say that, which I don't know. I don't know why that matters to me, but um, I think it puts pressure. I think when I say like, oh, I'm in training, I feel like I actually should be doing a lot more if I was in training training because my version of training is quite intense. It's like biggest loser. <laughs> Oh, are you right, Bianca? Totally missed the bed. Fell <laughs> into a bag. Um, anyway, I came back because I have an audition in three weeks, I believe, from today. So that'll be good. I actually, I mean, it's hard to know whether I want to know about auditions like months in the future or if I like them to kind of spring up out of nowhere. Three weeks to me is like, a, it's enough time. It's not like, oh, I have an audition in three days and I just found out about it. That's too short. I don't really love that. But when I have an audition that's months away, I can become a little complacent about how I prepare for that. And then I think three weeks is a pretty good amount of time because it gets me into a rhythm. I tend to like, you know, be a little bit more strict with how I'm going, uh, you know, with my food intake and with getting to the gym and going to Zumba and going to dance classes. Dance classes specifically because I have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that? I have to pay. Um, well, I have to pay, but it, it can be about like 20 bucks each. And so it's not cheap. And I feel like I have to, like, I wouldn't just keep doing that all year because I just can't afford it. But I would absolutely, like, invest, you know, a, a good amount of money just before an audition to go to all those dance classes because it's a really good way to brush up on everything that I just haven't done in forever, which is not the way I used to do it. Honestly, I used to just kind of wing it, but now I feel like I'm a little bit older and my body needs to be a little bit more prepared for what happens because even if I can push through in the audition and just kind of do everything, it'll take me out for a couple of days afterwards. Even if I can walk the next day, I'm, I'm not running and I'm not jumping. <laughs> uh, so I feel like I'm actually doing a pretty good thing now. This has been the past few auditions, actually. I've been getting into a routine of like going to dance classes and doing a bit of training as a part of my preparation, not just like, you know, getting my food in order. 
Having said that, I just had Chinese for lunch, but <laughs> that was its own mental issue that I was dealing with. Anyway, let's get into the video. I'm here to chat to you, honestly. It's like midweek. I want to upload this midweek just so I can catch up with you. Um, and I need to take a break as well because not only have I done dance class, but I'm in, uh, I I'm making my Daisy Style Workshop. So I've got uh, tutorial brain and I just kind of need to take a step away from everything, just chat, just catch up with you and, and kind of hang out. So I'll be having my coffee and sharing with you a bunch of stories that have absolutely nothing to do with the 100 day project you're going to see on the screen. I've, I've almost finished. It's almost the end of the 100 day project, but I still have a bunch of videos to share with you of the process. One of them, I think I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to keep it real time and I'm going to narrate through what I did. So hopefully that will be out soon. It won't be like a step-by-step -step tutorial because when I film those, I almost exclusively film that narrating it live while I do it. And then sometimes they either cut that down or I do a good job of just kind of going straight through. But I can't find to, like, I can't seem to find a way that is effective <laughs> unless I script it, which honestly sounds like way more effort than it's worth. Um, but I mean, I could consider it one day, I guess, if I really needed to. If I film a video and it just, because I usually watch YouTube over on my iPad while I'm doing it. If I film a video and I'm just not live narrating it, uh, it, it becomes mute when I edit it. And then I have to do this voiceover. And I tend to, like, when I'm teaching, want to just, like, like demonstrate a little something or, like, point to something specific to explain what I'm doing. And I feel like that's how you get a lot of the really good information is when I'm actually in it. But then after the fact, like, I can't judge the pace of how quickly I did it. And then sometimes I'll see myself doing something and I'll think, well, how do I explain what that is? Because I, I, if, if I really wanted to explain it, I'd probably do a little demo over here. So I feel like doing a tutorial, narrating it after the fact, doesn't tend to work out super well. But I do think there's some benefit to it. Um, and not even like a tutorial style, but more of like an informative uh, style. Like you're just, I mean, I tell you like what I use, I'll tell you the techniques, I'll kind of explain a few things. And so you can still glean information from it, but it's not really a step by step. Some people do like to work alongside those videos. And I, in the past, used to work alongside people doing stuff like that. Like I do a whole playlist of YouTube videos and then I just kind of put them on and, you know, every time and now and then I'd glance up at the screen and see what they're doing and kind of implement it. Or if they said like, oh, use an eraser over this pen and it kind of looks like this, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll try that. But as far as like learning, like getting your good learning in, I find it really difficult to do a video that way. So all of that to say, I pre-filmed all of these um, with no live talking. We did do a live stream. I've been doing my live streaming a little bit more recently on here and on Instagram. Um, I don't have a schedule for it. I just pop up when I pop up, but I probably could have done that now, actually, because I just wanted to chat. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I'll do this video anyway, um, and I'll probably go live at some point and just chat. But it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to to do some of the tutorials live, like in our workshops, the Virtual Voyage ones. I love the live ones, because then not only is it, like, informative and I can step through everything step by step, but then also people can weigh in with real-time questions, like, what did you mean by that, or... Can you show that again? <laughs> Which is uh, something I would never actually instruct myself to do. When you're teaching something, you think you've you've shown it all, and you feel like you've done a good showing, a good job showing it. But a lot of the times I am teaching, people do ask to see something again, and I think that's just an interesting thought that I've never really thought of. But I would never know what to show again, and if I had to do everything double, I would just assume people would just put the video on again and watch it again. Anyway, wild trains of thought happening in my head. It's a gorgeously overcast day today, so it's really nice and cool, which is good because I'm just a little roasting. The news going on in life, I told you about my new niece. We got a new niece. My little baby sister has had her third child and it's been so gorgeous. It's really bittersweet because obviously I want to be at home. She's in Australia. Um, and she's one of the only... Uh, family members I have that still live near the central coast anymore. Everyone's gone now. So it's, yeah, I mean, times are changing. It's tough. I get really homesick. I had this conversation with Steve the other day. Um, it just kind of like trying to identify what specifically it was that made me feel super homesick. Because if I could, I would do whatever it was here, right? Like I would implement what I was missing here. And then maybe I wouldn't feel as homesick as I do. And I've struggled with that for a while. 
very intensely through the pandemic. I think a lot of expats probably felt <laughs> a little bit anxious to get back home for a visit. But, uh, you know, even when I used to work on cruise ships and on contracts overseas, like I was younger. I mean, I love my family, but I wasn't like desperate to spend a ton of time at home because I think I was just living such an exciting life and traveling and dancing. And I mean, I was just in that age. I was in that very like self-centered young 20s just doing whatever I wanted to do so I mean I really wasn't too concerned with homesickness I did miss my family from time to time but for the most part I was just happy to be independent and you know doing my thing as I get older I think everyone gets older and gets a little bit more sentimental and has a little bit more wisdom but it was very uh it was very eye-opening when I got uh injured and uh when I was after my accident at home and I had that really long period of uh stay at home that was when I felt like, oh, I'm having a really unique experience here. Like no one, no one, not no one, but like a lot of people aren't gifted this opportunity at, you know, 25 to just spend a ton of time, a ton of downtime, like with your family. And I was allowed, I'm allowed, <laughs> sorry, I keep knocking my, my metal straw. I could spend some time at home and I was with my family and we all kind of lived on the same property. So I was uh, helping raise my nephew my sister would go to work and I would just mind him all day with my auntie. My auntie lived on the property as well. Uh, my mom, my stepdad, like my sister and her little family at that point was just, uh, well, they were dating. That was her boyfriend and Elijah, the baby, who was he's literally eight years old now. This is so crazy how long ago that is. Um, but yeah, I had such an amazing time and life was so slow. And I knew then, even though as much as I wanted to, you know, I wanted my, my, injuries to heal and I wanted to go back to dancing and traveling and everything, I felt like I shouldn't take for granted how special this experience is because I got a chance to, and you know, even though I visited home between contracts for years, this was such an extended period of stay. I got to, I got to experience living amongst my family with like almost no pressure to do anything except just be a part of the family and at an age where I wasn't being parented because I was 25 and my mom just doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't really care to do that anymore. Um, so it was a really unique experience that I always knew I would appreciate, but I didn't realize I would miss, if that makes sense. Like, I kept looking for silver linings the whole time I was home, and, and one of the biggest things was just spending so much time with my family. You know, because I left as well, like, I love my little sister, she's like one of my favorite people, and I always wanted a little sister, like, just so badly and I she was such a tomboy she would never let me do her hair she never wanted to wear clothes but eventually she uh she would play with me and I would dress her up and make her a little Barbie doll and then I would take photos of her like we were playing America's Next Top Model and yeah I mean look eventually my sister grew to be a little bit more girly but yeah it was it was a rough start <laughs> I was also very overbearing because I wanted nothing more than a little sister. I had a twin brother, so I was never alone, but I just really wanted a baby sister. I wanted a real life doll. I said that at her wedding speech last year. I was like she was my real life Barbie doll um but yeah i and so being there with my sister there and then her having her baby and getting to see that so up close and personal, like watching her learn how to be her own mother and then just seeing that part of my family like like extend another little branch was so crazy to me and when I it, it was the, kind of like a, the most time I'd really spent with my sister and it didn't really occur to me but like ever since she wasn't a little girl like I remember I always feel like she's my little sister because I mean technically she is but when I left home I was 18 I went straight from high school to Tokyo Disneyland to dance and my sister is seven years younger than me so she was 11 when I left which is still little like she's she was just a little girl um and so every time I would come back from a contract I was only home for a month two months three months max I feel like I don't think I was home for long at all um literally probably three months maximum and so I would see my sister when she would come to visit me on contract or when I would go to see when I would go home in between contracts and I only see her for this short period of time. And she was growing so quickly because, you know, I saw her at 11 and the next time I see her, she's 12. And 
you know, puberty is happening. And then all of a sudden she's a teenager. And then I, she looks completely different. She's acting a little different. <laughs> she was always my baby sister. And we always love seeing each other. And the poor thing, every time she'd come to visit on a contract, like two or three days before she knew she was leaving, the tears would just start. <laughs> oh, bless her. I really love my little sister. I love my whole family, but I have such a soft spot for my little sister. Um, <laughs> And now her little babies too. It's so weird because they're like, they really remind me of Siobhan when she was little. So sometimes I look at them and I just think like, I can't get the feeling out of my head that it's Siobhan again. Like it's a little Siobhan, but I have to remember that they're their own like new people. They're not, <laughs> it's just not history repeating itself, even though it feels like it. Anyway, where's my story going? Oh yeah. So I left when she was so little. So this time when I actually got to be at home and I was 25, which made her what? 17? 17. 18. She was 17, 18. Um, yeah, I think she had Eliza when she, Eliza, Elijah when she was 17. So I think she was 17. Um, cause I was there for the birth, but then I went away. So she was 18 when I came back, which still like, I mean, that's, that's young. She, she was a young, <laughs> young mom, like young teenager. So I got to spend so much time at home and then really got to I guess kind of experienced that as well. Like I just, I, I really knew how special it was when I had it, but I just didn't anticipate missing it. I don't know what I thought. Cause I didn't know what life was going to be like, to be honest, I'd never really like planted roots anywhere since I'd left, uh, high school. I was traveling on cruise ships or I was, uh, living in Japan and it, it was always, I was so transient. Like it was only for nine months at a time. So I always felt like I'd see my family super often. And even the thought of moving here, because I knew I was going to marry Steve, I knew we were, I was immigrating here. I felt like, well, yeah, I'll just visit home. And then you just don't realize how expensive it is to visit Australia. And it's not the closest place in the world to just get on a flight and go to, or, you know, you got to coordinate times for when the family is available too. Cause like, why would you come if you can't see anybody? Like you need to go when they're on holidays, which th that's all staggered. So it just, it became much more apparent when I got here that uh, homesickness would be an issue that I might face a little bit more than I did previously. And then cut to me aging and then feeling more sensitive and, uh, you know, sentimental than I ever did before. It, it would just, it, I think that was one of the hardest things I felt about moving was just the extreme homesickness. And all of that to go back to my original point when Steve and I were trying to figure out what was it? Like, what is it specifically that I miss the most? There's a lot of obvious factors. I just miss, you know, my family and living close to them because then you can bounce into their events and everything. But, and I miss food. Like I really miss custard tarts. Like I will shed a tear over a custard tart. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm crazy enough to admit it. I do really miss Australian food, but the thing that is just kind of irreplaceable and that makes me really upset if I think too hard about it. Cause I feel like whatever, let's just not go there. But, um, there is a special kind of comfort that I feel. It's like a familial, safe, like, and it's like a, an absolutely, like, nothing experience, but it's just a comfort. Like, it's not going to the parties, it's not going to Christmas, it's not running to the beach and having a good day out, it's not, like, even playing with the kids. Like, yes, I love playing with the nephews and nieces, but the thing that I miss the most is, like, Pardon me. My mum at my sister's house, she has this couch that's like basically five beds glued together. It's huge. But my mum is always asleep on one over there when she's visiting. And uh, I, I'll i sit on the couch here and Siobhan will be over on the couch. Just my little sister. She'll be over there just like fiddling with her, sh her charcuterie board because she doesn't eat full meals. She just makes charcuterie boards for some reason. <laughs> They're all really good. Um, I miss that too. But yeah, she'll just be over there. My mom will be over there asleep. The children are running around the house. So they're just ambient noise in the background. And I'm just watching telly just kind of zoned out. But I just feel so rested and I feel so comfortable and I feel so like safe and secure. And there is no pressure to do anything or to be anywhere or to say anything. And that's the thing. It's like it all happens in silence. Sorry for the jump cut. Steve just called me telling me some, I'm assuming good news. I was like, I'm filming. I'll call you in a second. <laughs> um, but anyway, what I was saying, yes, it's a very quiet, like almost silent experience that 
I just purely relates to how I feel around my family and that sense of comfort that I just I have my own kind of comfort here. I, I love the cats and I love my husband and I love my little family and life here, right? My friends. Um, but I don't have that familial comfort here. I don't have that safe space that's like maybe something, and I don't even really know, but I'm assuming maybe it has something to do with the fact that it's like, it's my mom. Like it, that's, I'm always going to feel like that around my mom. I'm always going to feel like, even though I'm 32 now, like I'll be around my mom thinking like, oh, I'm safe because it's like mom's there. Like nothing's bad. Nothing, nothing bad's going to happen because mom's there. Or then like my little sister's there and I'm like, I, I feel like I can be a child again too sometimes. And I don't have to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders as an independent adult, which is so funny because you think about all the times when you're younger and you're just like, I can't wait till I'm older and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then you just think, well, all I want to do is crawl back into <laughs> crawl back into my childhood and sit there for a little bit longer. Anyway, that's that. So I'm feeling a bit homesick. It's not a sad thing. It's just obviously exacerbated by the fact that we have a new little family member. Her name is Sophia Amelia. And I think that's so beautiful. That's her middle name. She's not hyphenated or anything, but so Sophia, uh, Savannah can't say it yet, and I've adopted her nickname for her, so I'm calling her Shoshi for now, which I have I don't think I ever call my sister Siobhan. I say it here because that's her name, and I'm trying to, like, build, like, put a name to the face if you see the photos on YouTube, on um, Instagram or whatever, but I, I literally never call her Siobhan. I've always called her every name but Siobhan, and every derivative of every derivative. So I have a whole list somewhere, <laughs> I think I put it in my travel journal. I usually call her Ron, or Hawan, or Dabon, Jabon, Gabron. We, we used to call her Savannah, but now that she has a daughter called Savannah, we don't usually call her that anymore. My mum used to call her Bonnie, or Bon. Just so many things. I, I, Sawan, I call her Sawan a lot. It's mostly because she, when she was younger, couldn't say Siobhan. <laughs> she had a really massive overbite and a really, a really pronounced lisp. And so, and Siobhan is such a hard name to say anyway, and to spell, S-O-B-H-A-N, it's Irish, and my, and so it's people are like, what's your name, little girl? And she goes, Siobhan, and so, anyway, sometimes a princess, I call her princess, or Pinteth, <laughs> she was so cute with that lisp. Anyway, so her children, I also don't call them by their names, I call Lige, 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 Lige Lulu, Jaiji Juju. Uh, we used to call him Moolop for some reason. I don't know where that came from. Siobhan had that. Uh, and then Savannah, I usually only call Savannah Hootie Booty Bell or Hoots. And that was after she, <laughs> she developed a hooting, a proclivity for hooting instead of talking and using her words. She actually couldn't speak at the time. So it was kind of cute. And now I actually find it sad that she can speak because she doesn't hoot anymore, but I still call her Hootie or Hoots to Boots. And then Shoshi. And that's the only nickname I have for Sophia right now. Siobhan's calling her Soph, which, I don't know. I'm going to call her Shoshi for now. But I love her. I love the babies. I want to go and see them. I want to hold them. But she's so fresh. She's, like, what, just a week old now. So, I mean, she's really not doing much but sleeping. She's very peaceful. <laughs> very peaceful, very placid baby. She took her full time to cook. She was like, I'm not coming out until you guys force me out. So, I think Siobhan was in... I mean, was she induced? I think she was induced. She was induced for Elijah as well. Her children just really get comfortable, which is so funny because my sis I always say my sister's favorite pastime is just to be comfortable on the couch, <laughs> which is totally true of her children as well. But they're rat bags. Anyway, I love them all and I really want to go and see them, but who knows what's going to happen. It's, I think that's one of the other things that I get a little worried about with dancing coming back into my life, because this has been such a blessing in the sense that I could choose my own schedule. And pending I actually, my business makes some money and I can afford to do things, I can use that to my advantage to go and visit my family whenever I need to go and see them. But uh, with dancing, it becomes a little bit harder because, you know, I used to dance on contracts, which meant I, I would just block out like six to nine months of that contract. But doing it here and actually dancing locally, like dancing at Disneyland or um, I'm auditioning for Knott's Berry Farm. Like they want, Knott's Berry Farm specifically wants you to commit to like the entire run. Like you can't miss anything. So pardon me. That, you know, it's it's not like a contract in that I have to fully book it out because I could say like, 
you know, on a Tuesday, I can go and do something like I'm not on a ship. I'm not stuck in the middle of nowhere. I can go and do something. But can I do something that takes like, can I go away for the weekend? Probably not. And then how do I get three weeks off to just go and visit my family, which I can. I'm sure there'd be a break in there somewhere, but I just don't know. Really, I don't really know what's going on yet. I don't really know what my season is going to look like towards the end of the year because I haven't haven't even auditioned for this thing and I haven't received any offers to do anything else. So technically right now I'm fully open this happened last year too. I was fully open and then I made all my plans and then suddenly I was having to, you know, be excused from certain rehearsals and then maybe not doing the things because I was busy for something else. Like I had to, when I auditioned for Knott's Berry Farm last year, I couldn't actually do the job because I was going to miss part of the run. So it just all becomes very confusing and I'm basically whinging about not being able to have my cake and eat it too, which Steve was telling me. If you want to be a dancer, like, that's a part of it. Don't forget, like, there was all the other parts that you struggled with. And I was like, well, I didn't really struggle last time. Honestly, I just, I, that was all my life. I didn't, I didn't know anything else. But I had never tried to balance being a dancer with being a real life human who lived on land and had, you know, bills and cats <laughs> and a husband. <laughs> when I was a dancer, I had nothing. I had no bills. I had no debt. I just kind of left home, got paid to travel and they fed me and clothed me. Well, they didn't clothe me, but they put me up and I, I really like, I can't tell you how crazy it was to try and make that transition and realize what the rest of the world had been doing and like how the rest of the world had bills and rent and things like that. I didn't hit that experience until like 26. Literally lived that entire time not knowing what that world was like. <laughs> I mean, I had my own things here and there, but yeah, I don't think I became like a real adult until 26, which was fun. So I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it, but it's still in the back of my mind. I would love to go home. I think maybe if I can figure out, if I get some offers for something at some point and I can figure out what times I will be available and, what, and won't be available. And I have to look at my finances because I really don't have a lot of spend money right now, but I do want to go to Australia and I might just... I might just pop in if I can find a, fl a cheap flight, like end of July, maybe, hopefully. But that's all pie in the sky thinking, isn't it? The other thing that I, I think I'll share this story with you before I go, because I got to talk to Steve about what I think he was calling me about. Uh, oh no, he said an agent. He was talking about some agent thing. So no, it's not really that related. But last week, Steve had a big photo shoot that like... I'm not going to say it suddenly became his dream, but like more recently he's been trying to uh, be a bit more intentional about where he wants to take his photography, which I mean, it's great. I love watching it, but it's, he, he has a big dream. Like he's not, he's not aiming for the small leagues, which is where I was, so I was like, aim like here and then everything will be a surprise beyond that. But bless him, he is confident and he wants to go for it. So I will be supportive. And, and I actually do think he has the talent to make it to where he wants to go. So I will, um, I will be a part of that journey, but it was a lot of work and I can't share any photos or videos from it because it's still, his whole aim for that photo shoot was to get it published. So it's kind of bad form for me to like share it with people before people have actually seen it in publication, but he's in the process of shopping it around to publication. So it's... I don't really know what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, he's just casting a wide net and seeing what happens. And I'm happy to, you know, hold off and wait, even though I hate waiting because <laughs> it was so good. I was actually just so impressed. He did such a good job. Um, I can tell you parts of it. He did. And if you don't know this, my husband is a photographer and every now and again, I, w I was going to have him on here, but I just started talking. So he can tell you the story again later. Um, from his perspective. I'm, you know, we're not afraid of repeating stories around these parts. He, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when he found out that he was going on furlough, I was like, well, you have a whole bunch of extra time, so you should probably focus on something creative or like keep your hands busy, you know, go do, go do your photography or something. But the sad part is you're not, we weren't really allowed to see each other. So he only had me to photograph. <laughs> and as much as I'd love to believe that I am his ultimate muse, I just know that's not completely true. And all my he all my years of history practicing America's Next Top Model in front of the mirror. Look, we did. I gave him some money at the beginning of the um, thing. I was like, "This can be my little investment. I'm gonna like produce his talent." Um, <laughs> mostly because he was so unsure of it, and I was like, "Look, I'm gonna buy you this for you, so you don't feel any guilt." But like, 
Actually, no, that's exactly why I did it. I wanted him to feel guilty enough to do it. It was a course on studio lighting because he had some little flashpoints that he has in the house and I was like, just practice it, just learn it, see what you can do. Uh, we'll do some little photos inside the house. And then I was doing Virtual Voyage 1 and I was like, oh, great, you can take the portraits for it because I want to put them on Instagram and show everyone that we got dressed up like idiots and you know people can enjoy that. And then I can print them out for my journal. Uh, and so that's how that whole thing started. And yeah, we took, we took the first portraits of those at the studio that he now currently occupies with his own business. So that's kind of like a full circle moment for us. But he now owns that, well, not owns it, but like he, well, he owns his own business, but he rents that studio. Um, and it is a wonderful little place where he has a lot of clients that come in and do editorial type shoots now, which was a lot of what I was like hoping he would practice throughout the pandemic and you know he did a really good job he learned so much and he really really did apply himself to it and push through every bout of imposter syndrome known to man even including last week because it was really out for full force last week but yeah he eventually got to this place where he was like I actually I think I could do photography as more of a, a like a main career path or like he he's not I'm not going to speak for him and say he's finished with anything in particular. He's in like this big possibility and opportunity stage, right? Like you just don't know what's going to happen. So I think he's just opening all the doors and seeing which ones he should walk through. Um, but yeah, he's been getting really, really good at it. I have always kind of pushed him more to this fashion editorial angle selfishly because I just love that. And it's my fantasy too. And I actually assist him with a lot of the photo shoots and, uh, do a lot of the, like, assistant work. I'm still terrible with some things that I know I should have learned, so I could never do it, but <laughs> I, I'm like the the way that my mum wanted to be an assistant. She used to say that her dream was to work at a bridal boutique and help all the women, like, try on their dresses, but that her role was just to be there and be excited for them and drink champagne with them and, like, give them champagne. Like, I don't think there's a job that exists like that, just professional hype woman, but um, it's essentially what I do at Steve's studio. I do have some small roles. I do the wind. Have you ever seen me put that in my uh, Insta story? We have these poster boards that I do this, like, little gusts of wind to get that hair blowing, Beyonce Knoll style. And I do posing. It, that's not an ironic uh, Instagram bio that I have. I am literally Steve's posing coach. I'm a posing coach for Steve. I don't really pose Steve. He's got it down. He's learned now. But <laughs> um, yeah, actually, funnily enough, all the little top model photo shoots I did with my sister, all the America's Next Top Model I ever watched, every fashion magazine that I collected and archived at home from age 14 beyond uh, actually was worth something in the end because now I help do the posing. I will say, like, it's not something <laughs> I've, I have any qualifications to do so don't tell Steve's clients that um but I have really like put in the work if there was work to put in bar actually being a model myself <laughs> which I would have done if I'd had the opportunity <laughs> plus size modeling wasn't a thing back then <laughs> but yeah I I do the posing coat the posing stuff and you know what my qualification is dancing uh, because I feel like as a dancer I know how to contort my body and how to tell people what to do with theirs so I do have some qualifications, but definitely not for modeling. Um, we go and do those shoots. Yeah, so anyway, he got to the point where he wants to focus on being published in fashion editorials, like fashion magazines, and particularly just a couple that he really, really likes. And so I was like, you know what? It's not such an out there idea. Like, you could do it. There's absolutely a possibility where you could do it, and I want you to do it if you want to do it. You know, I think it's great to have these dreams and these goals and they don't have to mean anything other than like you would just like to do that and say you did it. Like, I'm all about it. So we've been working on that. He was lucky enough to get connected with a friend of a friend who is, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a Paramount Plus television show called Rise of the Pink Ladies, which is a spinoff on Greece. It's kind of like Greece meets Glee. Um, and it's a television series, and one of the lead actors from that, Trisha Fukuhara, is, uh, she's one of the pink ladies in that. Uh, we did a photo shoot with her, and Steve had come up with this whole uh, color story themed shoot that had a nod to um, her Japanese heritage and also the, the Greece influence. Like, there were little nods to Greece and the Greece, like, 50s nods. 
and then nods to Japan as well. And it was, he titled it Hopelessly Devoted to Pink, which I thought was really cute. And it was a whole pink editorial, pink on pink on pink on pink. We had to buy everything pink, everything pink. And he did some really great stuff with it. And I was super impressed. He had um, a stylist uh, from LA who was actually someone that he's known since he was like young. And that was really fortunate that that connection was there. And then we had a stylist assistant who they worked together to pull all these pieces from a showroom, which is so crazy because I've always wanted to be a part of this like fashion editorial experience. And I never in a million th years thought that like Steve would be running it and that I would be a part of it. <laughs> it was truly like actually a dream come true for me. So, you know, maybe there is a point to me sharing this story, but mostly I'm just proud of him because it was a lot of work and it was a lot of people coming together. And then even just beforehand, like I think two days before, the hair and makeup artist dropped out. So we had to find another uh, hair and makeup artist. We ended up asking Stella if she felt like she was up to it. And Stella came and did it and slayed it, obviously. Um, so that was great. That was really nice to have her a part of it because Stella's been there with us like the whole time. She's always been the makeup artist at our shoots. So, and we've had other people when she couldn't really come in, but we've always, it's always just kind of been Stella learning alongside us learning. And we all knew that we we're all learning together. So it was really special to have her there too. Um, but Stella doesn't do hair right now. I think she might learn in the future. I'm not sure. So we had another hair artist, thank goodness, like literally the day before say that she was available and I could come and do it. So that worked out because we wanted to do some specific hair stuff that I said to Steve, I could probably do, like I've done it on my sister before, but I don't feel comfortable really doing it on like a, a person that I'm not related to because <laughs> like, I don't care if my sister is telling me that it hurts, <laughs> but I do care if, if a client is saying that it's hurting, like I can't, I can't just be yanking their hair out. So, and my sister did, I mean, she, whatever. I will say, I have to take it all back. When I grew my hair out long and I started brushing it, I felt how much those knots hurt. I thought, oh, my poor sister. Like, I always just thought she was being so dramatic, but she was dramatic in other ways. That's the thing. It was the girl who cried wolf. So I really should, I, how was I to know that <laughs> that hurt, but the other things didn't hurt? I don't know. Anyway, poor Siobhan. Sorry, Siobhan. <laughs> the hair and makeup people. Yeah, so we had hair, makeup, stylist, styling assistant. I was photographer's assistant. And then Steve, the photographer, and it was all day. Like, girl, it was 12 hours. Everyone was working for that shoot. And it actually turned out really wonderful. It, you know, it was exactly what Steve had set out to do. And now that he has all these images, he's just looking for a publication. And, you know, it just is such an interesting world out there because I, I didn't know that's how that kind of worked. I didn't, I thought all the magazines contracted every single feature and article that they had. Uh, which some might do. I, I feel like Vogue is probably, you know, they're probably setting it all up themselves. But a lot of these other fashion magazines, are uh, they have like contributing editors and, you know, people who it's basically like freelancing and it's it's kind of compartmentalized into different areas. And people are essentially gathering all of these editorials from all around the world and packaging them up into the issue and kind of seeing if they all relate and if they want to run stories on certain things. So essentially we have all of the imagery for whatever would be run. Um, I personally don't think it would end up in a fashion spread just because we don't have like name brand fashion. We had great fashion there, but none of it is like, well, like we didn't have any like, um, like French fashion house uh, fashion, like no Chanel, no Dior, no Prada, no nothing, nothing that would be like a main advertiser in a, in a glossy high fashion mag. So I feel like it's more, it's more aimed for, like, if we, if they could do a write-up about Trisha or if they wanted to, like, do an interview about her experience in, you know, the Rise of the Pink Ladies show. But it's all, it all, it's all dependent on them. Like, the, the magazines Steve has submitted to, like, one of them got back to him, was just like, it's just not a feature we'd be interested in running right now. So... Um, I thought that was nice, actually, that they kind of let them know that it's been rejected <laughs> so that he can go and focus on another one. But yeah, I just thought that was so interesting. Like, Steve's got this whole editorial ready to go and um, that even by the time that they work on it, or they, if they do accept it, they might only want, like, two photos from it. We did about six or seven looks. Um, and so I feel like you could use these three looks over here and build a completely different story out of it than if you use these three looks and build that story out of it. So it's very interesting to to see the behind the scenes. I'm quite fascinated by it and I really am enjoying watching it happen. 
Steve's very nervous and very anxious and excited about it all. So um, I'm kind of living in that space too. But it all kind of happened because he went to assist on a bunch of photo shoots for publication. There was a photographer that he followed on Instagram um, was looking for an assistant and they had like reacted to each other's work before on Instagram. And he was like, you know what? I just really feel like I have to go and do this. Cause he just wanted, he wanted to get out of like his own head. He wanted to go and experience it and see what it was like. And it was amazing. He said he had one of the best days he's had in <laughs> like a really, really long time. He was fully taken with it. He met so many different people. Now he's just really throwing himself out there at all these opportunities, just seeing what it's all about networking and working with different people and learning about it all. And he's just loving it. And I have always said that, like, I don't even care if I don't like what it is you're doing. If you're passionate about it, I am so on board. So to see Steve have this amount of passion for it, not that he wasn't passionate about it before, but I think there's a different passion you have when you're learning and you feel like you haven't learned enough yet. And then there's another kind of passion you get when you feel like, oh, I've got all the skills in my tool belt that I need for right now. I'll learn the rest as I go, but like, I've got enough now. Like I've got enough to fully charge forward. So he's there right now. And that's just really exciting, especially it's such a creative space too. Like I do love, I love photography in general. I love fashion photography because it is so like art journaling in the sense that it's a visual medium, it's a visual art. It is, you know, not that art journaling is heightened, but it's fantastical. It can be imaginary. I often say to Steve, like, I think some of my favorite editorial work in fashion photography is taking a lot of things that could, you know, they could be real clothes, I guess, or that, that, you know, you could see someone wearing them, but you would just never see it in that, it was styled that way, or you just rarely see it in that situation. Like, there has to be this element of subverting your expectations when you look at it. And I've always thought the same thing about really effective art journaling things that I've done. It, it just kind of subverts what you would expect a little bit. Like, it's not, you're not taking the literal and the obvious and just putting that down. You're taking parts of yourself and the way that you can imagine it up to be and presenting that to people. And they get to look at the, the kind of inner workings of your brain a little bit. And ultimately what you're presenting to people is your vision of what beauty is. You know, when people say like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, like it's hard to really know what that is for people because we don't just learn that about people. People aren't going to say, oh, here's everything that my eyes love, but an artist will show you what their eyes love. They will uh, present that to you. And so I feel like you get an intimate look at someone. I mean, it's obvious, it's cliche, but you do get a really intimate look at someone when you look at the stuff that they create. So assuming like a few parameters there, <laughs> like, I know some people are tortured artists, can't relate, girl. I love doing my art and I love the experience, <laughs> but I, I don't know if that really translates well for tortured artists, but in the, at the end of the day, like it's fine. Everyone does what they does. And Steve is having a good time, so I'm having a good time. But yeah, no, he wants to be, you know, published, which is great. He's been published before, but I think this is very specific. He wants to be in one of these publications that he would purchase from the bookstore if he went and uh, saw it there. So it's great. But the work that he did assisting with uh, the photographer, uh, I think her name is Michelle, um, that has been published in V Magazine. So if you follow Steve on Instagram, he was publishing all of that into his Insta story and sharing those stories. So that's what that was. He was, uh, the, he was the photographer's assistant, basically what I did for Steve, which I will say, like, even though Steve's in charge, he really does give me a lot of credit for like hopping into the process. And that feels really nice. I feel like it could have been, I would be honest, we didn't work well together in the beginning because <laughs> I'm, not only in life am I a bull in a china shop, but if I have to make a decision, like I would rather make a strong, firm, clear choice quickly than find out it's wrong, than sit with it, contemplate it, make the right choice based on a whole bunch of factors I should probably consider. I'm not that way. Like the way I do it is just, I'm going to choose that. I will move forward until I feel like I can't, then I'll choose something else. Um, so I can be very, some would say aggressive. Maybe that's a term some would use. <laughs> confident. <laughs> in the beginning, I was very, I think I was just very assertive, very aggressive. And so I had to learn how to back off a little bit because Steve was learning a lot. So it, it just came across as too much. 
um, but now that we've worked together enough for a long enough time and we know each other's rhythms, uh, we know I know when to back off a little bit, he know when to back off a little bit, like we both kind of get it. But ultimately I do still respect that he is in charge, but he has gifted me with enough leverage in these situations to make sure that, you know, I feel like I'm included as well as like, just like a creative voice in it. Like he doesn't make all the decisions without me, which sometimes he has, like, I've definitely tried to help him do that before. Cause I also don't want him to be reliant on me making a lot of choices. Um, and Steve does have that like kind of opposite personality type to me where he does have to make sure that things are right before he does them, which can just cause a long period of waiting in some such situations. So I think he's definitely learned a lot there, but still, I think now at this point, we just know that it's a bit of a better measure of success that we can both kind of input what we both feel confident with. Um, and so that really works out and that's been really great because I feel like I get to be a really big part of it as well. And uh, that I'm not just on the sidelines kind of watching it or being, I'm not, I'm not like just, what do they call it? Like manual labor. Cause I, I mean, assisting is really just a lot of helping reposition lights or like turning things on or sweeping a floor or putting up a backdrop. That is mostly what I was expecting an assistant assistant's role to be, but it's my husband. So I don't think he's just going to make me do that. So he gets me involved with a lot, but at this shoot last week, like I was involved in every part of it. And that was really confusing as well because I mean, my mom always says this, like, oh, it's real. Like, if she validates things that are legitimate by saying it's real, even if what you've done before is real. Like, every photo shoot Steve's ever done has been real. Like, it's a real shoot that we're doing for a real reason. But because this one is for a magazine, my mom would, she was like, oh, wow, it's real. <laughs> it's just stupid. But I, in my head, it makes sense. And Steve sees it the same way. And so I was saying, well, because we've got a stylist and hair hair and makeup artists and everything albeit we've worked with Stella before so we have that rhythm too um I was like Steve I don't know how much I should really get involved because this is real like it's not it's not one of your clients coming in and saying hey what do you think we should do and I'm like oh wear that dress with that jacket and you know we do a little bit of styling we do a little bit of coordinating uh you know most of the time the makeup has just been natural face but like fully elevated or we do like a glam moment but it's nothing too severe nothing too editorial because we're you know aiming to take for the most part a lot of real people and give them their editorial moment and so we we tend to do things that are generally like workable for everybody but in this instance you know we had no boundaries there were no reins to pull us in and it was just Steve and I thinking we can do anything but what should we do and I was like Steve you've been on these shoots like what did Michelle do in these shoots? Does she have a say in what the, what the clothes look like? Like, does she, because, like, the stylist brings everything, but did, does, did, does the photographer help style it? Like, wouldn't that be the stylist's job? And Steve was like, no, I mean, everyone, it depends. It can be anything. And so I was like, oh, well, I guess you're going to set the tone. So whatever you say goes. And I said to him, look, I'm willing to take this one on the chin if this is very different to all the way that we've done it before. Like, I will sit there and I'll be your assistant and I will just watch everything happen. But like, cause I was like, I don't think it's going to be like what I know it is going to be like from before. I felt like I was going to take a really steep back seat and just kind of watch it all happen, which I was fine to do. But yeah, we got in there and then everyone starts setting up and everywhere we went, Steve was like, James, what do you think about this? <laughs> it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I would do this and this and this. And he was like, what do you think about this? So essentially I did get to have my hands in all the pies, which was fun for me too, because as much as I love the photography, like I loved the styling too. And I love looking at the hair and makeup and having a choice in that. I feel like I get to help create these images as well. And to do it with Steve, like it's a very, it's a very scary thing to share your creativity with someone so intimately. Um, and I feel like there's, it's such an interesting part of being married and like doing something like that together because I think we're both aware that it's very vulnerable for both of us to kind of put it into this, put both of our opinions into this equation and see what wins out and see what ends up happening. But it was a great day. Am I getting way too into it? You're probably going to hear all this story again from Steve's point of view one day. So hopefully this was a good precursor to whatever he ends up saying, but it was great. I wish I could share the photos with you. Uh, maybe take a sneaky look 
at my Instagram at some point. <laughs> I'm sure I'll print some out and put them in my Hobonichi five year, but yeah, I probably won't until he gets published or he decides to release them or whatever happens in the end. Um, and I saw him do one thing that I thought was a really nice thing uh, that, that I just, I, it was so key to like how comfortable it all felt. And I know this sounds really obvious, but he was like very upfront about where he's at and he was not ashamed to admit that this was his first attempt at it. And I think that was so great because I saw somewhere recently on TikTok or something, there was this quote that someone had said that I'm not afraid to be seen trying. And that has just been on like repeat in my head. It really, really struck a deep chord with me because I feel like that too. Like, I don't know, I've always called it just delusional confidence, but at the same time, like I, yeah, I really, I'm not ashamed or afraid to be seen trying to do something, trying to achieve something, trying my best to, you know, to work hard at something or to get somewhere. Like, I really am not ashamed about that. I think it's such an admirable trait in people, um, you know, that they would try for things that are important to them. So he was being really upfront with everybody because there is a temptation in, spaces, especially if you're starting to work with, uh, you know, people who work in industries and they're, they're, you know, doing well in their industries and you're kind of, for lack of a better term, like you want to bolster your ego a little bit. You want to bolster your sense of self-importance, uh, in LA anyway, we're, we're lucky we're a little orange counties are a little removed from it. But, um, but in LA, like it can be a lot of, you know, I'm important because I'm associated with, or I have done X, Y, and Z. And that can be difficult if you're if you really are just starting out at something and you're really just starting to to do it, a lot of people don't or might not validate that. Like, well, you know, come back and talk to me again when you've done 15 published shoots and then I'll be interested. It can be a bit like that. So everyone, you know, Steve was very upfront saying like, I, I believe in myself, I believe I can do this, but I don't have a publication set. I am self-producing this. I believe in myself. I believe this will be great, but... I am also new to this, so, you know, what can I do to make you feel comfortable? What do you need to be successful on the day? Like, how can I accommodate that? And I just thought that place of humility that he came from really set such a wonderful standard for the day because everyone felt like no matter where they were at at that point, they also could come in and just do their best and that that was the goal, that we weren't holding anyone to an expectation that that would make them feel uncomfortable and that Steve didn't feel like he had to as well. Like you don't want to go in there and be like, Oh yeah, I've done this a million times before. And like, Oh, this is nothing for me. I've got this. And then be freaking out internally because then that gets in your way. And then you're fighting up against something that you actually didn't need to do all along. You could have chosen not to deal with that. <laughs> so I was very, I was very happy with him that he did that. I was very impressed and it set everyone up for a really wonderful time. Um, because truly, it was our first time, and why not? Why not let people know that, you know, this is the beginning, and one day we'll all look back at this and think, wow, I, you know, I fully remember that experience and how naive we were, or like, <laughs> I mean, we already learned a lot from last Wednesday, but it's, I think now back to when I first started YouTube and just had no idea what I was doing or no idea what I'd be end up, what I'd end up doing. I thought I was just going to be a part of a design team, and then suddenly I would just like. I don't know, I'd work at a local craft store or something and that would be it. Um, I thought, you know, Stella had started her YouTube channel. I only started mine because Stella was starting hers and I needed to do a video for that design team. So I was like, oh, I'll try it. Like, you just have no idea. You look back on it and you look back and you think you were so naive. But at the time you were like, no, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to give it a go. And you just never know. So I, I'm enjoying making my mental notes about this last week. I'm enjoying putting it into my physical five-year uh, Hobonichi so I can have a physical record of it and to literally, uh, you know, enjoy the journey up until such a time as I look back at now and think, wow, remember them. <laughs> so that's it. Just feeling very proud, feeling very good. I'm glad I've got this audition to look forward to in three weeks. So, you know, I've got a, I've bought myself another three weeks of something to look forward to. <laughs> I have to say it's been a little difficult. It's been rough for the past couple of months, but I can't keep beating that 
Can we say that phrase anymore? Eat the dead horse? I don't think we're saying that phrase anymore. <laughs> Someone said the other day we were, um, we're not saying kill two birds with one stone, which is so funny because I had changed it years ago for myself. And I used to say I would um, murder flocks with pebbles because I was going through a phase where I would take really like obvious sayings, but I would do the most exaggerated versions of them and just being crazy. So when they said... <laughs> And they said, like, that sounds terrible. We don't really say that anymore. I was like, oh, goodness, I better not say what I say. <laughs> You'll have a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, well, whatever the new way we say that is, but to, to, you know, sentiment still remains the same. I shan't keep going on and on and on and whinging about that because you already heard that sad song. But the rest of it's great. And I got these cute little shoes. You probably saw my other shoes that I got for dancing that I've been trying to break in. They're more like classic, um, you know, character black dance shoes. So classic. Um, they're really, really beautiful. I still have to break those in, but a friend had bought the wrong size for him in a boot version, like a zip up, like Newsies boot. And he was just on Instagram being like, I'm selling these boots because I, I need to get a size up. And I was like, great. If you've already worn them in, that's my exact size. So this would be great for me. So I had purchased them off him and he sent them to me and I just wore them to dance class today. I'm obsessed. Everyone was coming to me, commenting about them. And it's so funny because I couldn't think of Newsies at first when people are like, what do those boots remind me of? And I was like, I don't know, but it's something, but like all I'm pulling up right now is um, a little princess. <laughs> the little, like the little boots with the spats, the little buttons, the white and black buttons. They look like that, but without any of that. It was so ridiculous. It's not a... To me now, they're always going to be my Sarah Crew boots, but they're technically Newsies boots. Anyway, I don't know why I'm telling you about that, probably because I just saw them over there. But I had a great time dancing in them today, and <laughs> I didn't do... We just did technique today, so there was no video. I'm not going to share it on Instagram, but it's good. I always... I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of, like, just doing technique in a class, but especially before auditions. It's, like, one of those things that I think, ugh, oh, but it's really good for me. Like, it's, the, it's probably the best thing that could have happened, but... You know, I would never say no to a combo at the end. Anyway, that's it from me. Hopefully you had a good time watching this. I love just sitting down and chatting. Honestly, I would just chat all day if my voice box could handle it. I'll have another little sip mm, of my gingerbread cookie cold brew. And and I think it's... <laughs> doesn't matter. I think it's sugar-free. Like, <laughs> when I say gingerbread cookie cold brew, I think you're getting an idea. There's a lot of sugar in this. The, the cold brew has no sugar in it, and the oat creamer, so it's not even, like, regular milk. The ginger, I think it's mostly, because it tastes very, um, it's, I was gonna say it tastes fragrant, but it's the type of ginger that, like, gets into the back of your nose. It's not, it's not like a sugary ginger. So, just in case you were judging me for being fat. <laughs> it's a thin drink. <laughs> It's probably still not the best for you, is it? They say it has no sugar in it, but it has, like, what's the, the stevia or, like, 75 grams of <laughs> sweetener. Oh, goodness. All right, that's it for me. Have a lovely day, everybody. I'll see you again soon. Until then, I hope you enjoyed the 100-day project. And if you're doing the 100-day project, good luck to you in this final stretch. Everyone's been saying, not everyone, I've seen a few people been saying, like, should we keep going after the 100 day project because like it was supposed to build this good like daily practice for me honestly i'm saying no like for me once the 100 day project's done i won't be doing that again so <laughs> but i already have my daily habits so if you're one of those people that did it for a daily habit yes you have no choice this will be your 33,000 day project from now on you just won't be tracking it as such um, but yeah, I'll be leaving the stamp and illustration for a hot minute, probably until I get my new stamp set in, which I'm still working on. Um, pretend I never said anything, but like I'm working on that stamp set. And of course, when that comes in, I would love to use it because it has a bunch of face proportions that I have been loving recently that I don't have in these old stamps. These old stamps, it's so funny. I go back through them and I look at them and I'm, and I'm using them and I'm like, I make the same adjustments every single time now. So I fully know my preference has changed and that's why I need the new stamp set so that when I go to use the stamp set, I'm not shifting everything away. <laughs> anyway, that's for another time. Thanks for being with me. Goodbye.